What we learned is that the pharmacy benefit managers kind of control Are you up? the medication. They don't really answer to anyone. Thank you so much. So-called PBMs are private companies that act as middlemen for prescription drugs to save money. But are they adding a terrible cost? You had someone with more hope. It was all taken away from her by the system. This week, we investigate the middlemen, who controls them, and more importantly, who does not. Predictions for this winter are chilling. Europe is facing an energy crisis forced by the war in Ukraine. But the big freeze may not be so far away. If we get into a, a real cold snap, we could face issues. What would that look like? Rolling blackouts. We look at why heating America is a hot issue. And a step back in time to a way of doing business before internet sales took over the world. Is auctioneering just generally a big part of the culture here? Amish auctions and the sounds of success. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. America is more medicated than ever before, and for many, the cost of prescriptions is growing out of reach. When it comes to drug prices, you may automatically think about the pharmacy, the insurance company, and the drug maker. But there's an invisible middleman that started to play an increasingly large role, impacting benefits for hundreds of millions of Americans. Whether it's for better or worse is the subject of today's cover story. Like too many, Jamie Spada faced a grueling multi-year battle with breast cancer. She used her expertise as a nurse to help her navigate the health care system and remained optimistic. As long as she was able to try something and put in some and be able to fight, she kept fighting. But Spada's children, Gabriella and Sean Burst, say things fell apart in 2018. That's when their mother was prescribed a new medicine to try to slow her cancer. It became a dark turning point at a crucial time in her illness when somehow the prescription got held up for weeks. They kept coming back with issues, but it would take days for them to come back that there was an issue. And then it would take days again for them to come back with an issue. You had someone with more hope, more conviction that she'd be saved than any other cancer patient I had ever met, that it was all taken away from her by, by the system. After much investigation, they blame delays on a little known but important link in the medicine chain, pharmacy benefit managers. So what we learned is that the pharmacy benefit managers kind of control the medications that come in through the specialty pharmacies with the insurance companies. So they kind of have like their own discretion. They don't really answer to anyone. Pharmacy benefit managers, or PBMs, are private companies hired by insurance sponsors, like your employer, to act as middlemen for prescription drugs to save money. They manage drug benefits and negotiate group discount prices with pharmaceutical and insurance companies. Are you picking up? Okay. But pharmacy benefit managers are becoming a growing sore spot among patients, doctors, and local pharmacies. Uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Dr. Christopher Vaughn is an owner of this cancer treatment center and medicine dispensary in Fredericksburg, Virginia. A lot of our patients, especially in the world of oncology, need treatment immediately. Um, and unfortunately, with PBMs as sort of this mediary and third party, there's a delay in getting access to medications, and it can be anywhere from two to four weeks. Vaughn says pharmacy benefit managers have become more controlling, dictating what medicine patients can get and when, and are increasing the cost of drugs. I think they actually um, have contracts with, with higher cost drugs. Um, what unfortunately I think that cost is then transferred um, to our patients. So, so, uh, so I think it's actually not, not lower costs. I think we're finding our patients have higher out-of-pocket costs. Today, there are about 70 PBMs, ranging from big ones that have bought their own pharmacies, like CVS's Caremark, to smaller names you probably haven't heard of. 
Together, they form a powerhouse, managing prescription drug coverage for nearly 300 million Americans who have health insurance through their employers or government plans like Medicare and Medicaid. Congressman James Comer is the lead Republican on the House Oversight Committee. He's among those pushing to reform pharmacy benefit managers. They've made so much money, they've started buying into chain pharmacies and, and mail-in pharmacies. They're, they're their own entity. They're vertically integrated. They compete against independent pharmacies, and they manipulate the price of drugs. As PBMs have become more influential, drug prices have skyrocketed. Prices of newly launched brand name drugs have risen more than 10% a year from 2008 through 2021. Median prices for a year's supply was about $2,000 in 2008, more than $180,000 in 2021. This hearing will come to order. Today, Both Democrats and Republicans have put PBM executives on the hot seat. Five testified before the Senate Finance Committee in 2019. But so far, congressional inquiries haven't translated into action. The PBMs have become so big and profitable, they've started donating a lot of money to both parties. So both parties have been turned into blind eye. So when they talk about reforming drug prices, they've been given PBMs a pass when I'm confident that if you want to reform drug prices, the first area you start to reform are the PBMs. We represent America's pharmacy benefit managers. The companies will be- J.C. Scott leads the Pharmaceutical Care Management Association. He says rising drug costs aren't the fault of PBMs, quite the opposite. For example, he says hepatitis C medicine originally cost about $80,000 for a 12-week treatment, but pharmacy benefit managers quickly helped slash the price. As soon as we got that second competing drug that did the same thing into the marketplace and the third, then the PBMs were able to come in and begin to leverage that competition. And within the space of a year, the price of the drug, the cost of the drug was cut in half by 50 percent. Scott's group claims that by leveraging competition, PBMs will help provide savings amounting to more than a trillion dollars on prescriptions over 10 years. But what about PBM cost management that critics see as medical interference? Scott says it's actually efficient and cost saving, such as requiring patients to try the least expensive drug first. What if my personal physician thinks a drug I need to try now, which is not the cheapest drug that the PBM may say could be effective, but the doctor disagrees? What happens when there's a disagreement? So the, the physician and the patient always have the option to go to the drug that they to decide, and then the, the plan sponsor, the employer, however they've designed that plan, can decide if they're going to cover that drug or not, if it hasn't gone through the, the process that the plan sponsor has, has set up. So in, so in that have instance, to pay for it you, ha you, have to, you have to pay for it yourself, um, unless typically what happens is there's a robust appeal process that is intended to work in quick enough time depending on the patient's need. Yet delay was a factor, we told Scott, with Jamie Spada, the breast cancer patient whose medicine got hung up amid confusion surrounding approvals for her prescription and which pharmacy could fill it. They think the PBM system was in part responsible for this delay. Well, first, I'm very sorry to hear about the, that family's experience because we, we all feel that sense of urgency when a loved one is suffering from cancer or another disease. What happens sometimes in practice, it sounds like in your story that you just shared, is that that, that experience and that evolution doesn't happen on a real time enough basis. Scott says PBMs are working to address shortfalls. They also point to doctors who haven't modernized their own systems to speed up processing and communications. He's against congressionally mandated reforms. In 2018, when Spada's breast cancer prescription finally got to her home, it had been six long weeks. Too late, because while waiting, she'd suffered such a decline, she'd been hospitalized for the last time. There's lots of little hiccups along the way, but this was the one that was the straw that broke the camel's back. I really think that somebody can will themselves into another six months or eight months or 12 months, and I don't know that my mom would have lived another five years, but I think we got robbed of at least several months with my mom that we could have made memories and done things with. Instead of delivering hope in the form of another medicine to try, her daughter ended up delivering a hard truth. 
So I had to make the hard decision to tell my mom, mom and doctor say, you're never going to leave here alive if you don't go home on hospice. You're never going to leave here. And so we had to make the decision to send her home on a hospice and just let whatever happened, happen. In the absence of federal regulations, New York has created a new department specifically to work on regulating pharmacy benefit managers. Coming up next, how green energy is stoking fears of a cold winter. When Russia cut fossil fuel supplies, Europe quickly found out they couldn't make up for it with green energy no matter how much they wished for it. Now there are dire predictions about a dangerous winter there with energy shortages, rationing, and out-of-reach prices. It turns out Lisa Fletcher finds there are similar chilling predictions right here in America. Winters in New England are long, deep, and they can be wicked cold. Look at the wind chill by early tomorrow morning. Bitter cold. Staying warm in this region can be a challenge any winter. It could be more so this year, with natural gas and home heating oil in short supply. I don't like scarcities of anything because it creates havoc. Scott McFarlane is a second generation home heating oil supplier about an hour from Boston. When I started in the business working for my father, we were charging 15.9 cents a gallon for heating oil. And when we went up to 16.4 cents, I said to my father, I said, how are people going to be able to afford that? What are they going to pay per gallon this year? We're $5.99 a gallon, and we're making 25 cents a gallon less than we were a year ago. One winter blast could send prices even higher. It's the reason so many of McFarlane's customers, like Elizabeth Grimes, are topping off their tanks. The oil bill delivery that I just got right now, I mean, it's $100 plus more than what it was last month. I think everyone's going to be thinking about how much they're going to be spending this winter. Also in short supply, natural gas. If we get into a, a real cold snap, we could face issues. What would that look like if that happened this winter? We would have to be prepared for the potential of rolling blackouts. Here in Wakefield, Massachusetts, Pete Dion runs the Municipal Gas and Light Department. Utility prices here could jump by 30 percent, and that's not the worst of it. The colder it gets in Wakefield and across this area in winter, the higher the demand for utilities. So the risk for you isn't an average winter. The risk for you is a series of days that are really, really cold. Exactly. That type of situation would be very, very challenging this winter. Several factors are converging this winter to form what could lead to an energy crisis in New England. One, natural gas here is in short supply, following a decade-long fight by activists and lawmakers to halt gas pipeline expansion in favor of renewable energy sources. Utility companies say those projects will not be bringing sufficient power to the grid for several years. And two, the war between Russia and Ukraine. Russia is the world's largest exporter of natural gas. After Russia invaded Ukraine, Russia cut off a key pipeline to Europe. That created a desperate competition to find new sources, raising prices and cutting supplies everywhere else, including here in the U.S. The challenge this winter will be to make sure that there's enough natural gas in New England to support it. Are you worried that there won't be? I've become more worried over the past few months. In a time of very critical need, the only way this region satisfies demand is by importing liquid natural gas from foreign countries. This tank holds about 14 million gallons of so-called LNG, which is less than 1% of what it would take to power the state of Massachusetts for one day. And it all came from Trinidad and Tobago, Latin America's largest exporter. The Russia problem is also behind a dipping supply of crude oil imported to make the heating oil stored in these large drums. Before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the U.S. imported about 700,000 barrels of petroleum from Russia per day. Sanctions against Russia have tightened global supplies, leaving people like Elizabeth Grimes facing prices as much as 45 percent higher than last winter. 
think about my parents and their generation and, and they don't have the incomes that can support, you know, the continuing increase in prices and increase in energy prices. I think it's going to be a, a real tough winter for, for them. What I don't get, Texas is the nation's number one producer of liquid natural gas. So mm -hmm. why is New England importing it from foreign countries? Because of a 1920 law called the Jones Act, and it was created to basically bolster the U.S. shipping industry. And what it says is when cargo is moved between ports in the U.S., it has to be on ships that are flagged, built, crewed, and mostly owned in the U.S. And the problem is there are no gas transport ships that meet that requirement. So what's wrong with driving it in a truck from Texas to New England? We did the math. It would take about 272,000 tanker trucks a day to power the state of Massachusetts oh. for one day. My goodness. Great story. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks. Ahead on Full Measure, an update on a reporting on the Texas border invasion. Plans were delayed for this week's end to so-called Title 42, a Trump-era policy put in place in the early days of the coronavirus pandemic to allow for a quick stop and removal of illegal immigrants at the border. Democrats and Republicans have raised concerns about ending a policy that will open the borders to even more illegal immigrants when there's already one record after another being set. Last month, Texas Governor Greg Abbott tweeted that he was invoking an invasion clause to use National Guard troops and state authorities to turn back people crossing into Texas. The action is using a little-known authority that was described to us last spring by Ken Cuccinelli, Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security under President Trump. So under the Constitution, the states can repel an invasion without federal permission. This You're is not about immigration pull, pulling law. Pulling guns and fighting? Well, you know, this isn't tanks and planes. So this is literally just stopping people in the same way the Department of Homeland Security stops them in the desert. But instead of catching and releasing them, as the federal government does under their immigration agencies today, the states can turn them right back around into Mexico. And that power exists, you think, or it can be argued that that power is granted to the states in the Constitution? This isn't something that wasn't... Uh, thought about by the founders. Uh, they incorporated it in. They were very explicit that it doesn't just cover nation states, that it can cover any sort of hostile band or encroachment. And that's what we see going on on a scale we've never seen before on our southern border. The number of known illegal border crossers in 2022 was just under 3 million, a new record. When we come back, an Amish tradition of raising money and giving. Coming up next week on Full Measure. Two years after the January 6th Trump rally and Capitol rioting, questions about the FBI's aggressive role. Looked like a dozen agents around your house. Oh, there was 20 plus agents there. They had snipers, they had vehicles to block off the street. The fallout from one of the most prosecuted events in U.S. history, next week on Full Measure. Today we end with a colorful glimpse inside a staple of Amish and Mennonite life which we learned a little bit about on a recent visit. Auctions, they're always going on. They're used as community events to sell products, real estate, and raise big money for charitable causes. Here's our look at a little scene phenomenon we were invited to observe in the Plain community of Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Here, take a look at our auction home. Here we go. Hey. For more than two decades, Bruce Everly has been operating this produce auction in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, deep in the heart of Amish and Mennonite country. The auction itself has like 50 shareholders, so they do make some money. They do it mainly to have a place for the local farmers to have a place to sell their produce. Is auctioneering just generally a big part of the culture here? Yes, I would say it's a big part of it because, uh, like, if they're going to sell their property, they would use an auctioneer rather than just list it uh, for, like, a real estate agent. Bob Herr is here today to buy vegetables and fruit for his produce markets in New York and Pennsylvania. It's a big auctioning community. I'm actually an auctioneer. 
I don't practice a lot, but um, there was a lot of auctions here of produce, but also real estate, antiques, farm equipment. Um, it's um, it's a big big business around here. What'd you bid on today, and what'd you get? Uh, so far, it's only been the bins. So I bought white corn, bicolor corn, cantaloupes, uh, canary melons, the bright yellow ones there. Um, seedless watermelons and seeded watermelons. What's good about the auction versus a, tradition, a, a different way of buying? The quantity is here, the variety is here, and um, you know, and it really makes growers better because quality produce brings more money. So like tomatoes, there's a couple sellers of tomatoes, they'll bring $10 a box more than everybody else because everybody knows those are a premium grower. If it's a bad grower with wormy corn or short ears or something like that, nobody's going to buy it. Besides produce and real estate, they auction an impressive array of flowers and plants. One of the biggest drivers of auctions here is charitable causes. They raise millions. Everybody is expected to bring something and buy something. The turnout is impressive. The generosity, remarkable. At this auction to raise funds for a local woman with cancer, they ended up with an estimated $200,000. There's so many different ones. This Weaverland, where we are right now, they do a big one for a local fire department that's all volunteers, um, and people are very generous in their what they donate to sell and also in their bidding people will pay more. Um, Leola Auction has a really big one for um, special needs children in the Amish community. The local hospice auction that goes on for two days that raises big, big money. One thing I noticed at the charity auction, people were bidding much more oh, than yeah, absolutely. what yeah. something was worth. Right. People around here are very generous, very giving. Um, I mean, for example, the, the last church missions option I did was a very small church. Well, I don't know, it might be a couple hundred members, but everybody turned out. The first tomatoes of the year, like a little box, I was selling them for like $50, um, you know, anything, you name it. I mean, especially if it's something that somebody made themselves. You're helping a good cause, guys. Five and a half, six hundred dollars, and a half. I've even seen families, like, that will see something and just bid it up like two people in the same family just to push the price up but it's a nicer way than just flat out donating there's a lot of that too they're very community oriented um, you know, they'll help each other out if the needs of arise they're very you know, conscientious and uh, god is a big part of their life so six hundred dollars back there left hope you enjoy this week's program thanks for watching until next time, we'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable.